so here we are, Senate Government Operations on Thursday, September 10th. And uh, let's start going through uh, what is now, uh, doesn't have a number yet, but um, hopefully by the end of today, it will. So, and then we'll have to find out the procedure for, because I don't know, does it have to go to editing? Tucker is shaking his head. So is Betsy Ann. We're edited. Draft has already gone through the editing process. Okay, and so because this is a committee bill, it just goes immediately to the floor. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. All right, so do you wanna start going through it? Let's start at the beginning. Tucker. Okay, so section one is again, your open meeting law section of the bill. Um, would you like me to highlight the changes that were made based on yesterday's testimony and discussion? I think right. that would be, yeah. Um, the first change that I made is somewhat technical, but it was based on yesterday's discussion and some of the concern around um, how these provisions are going to be interpreted when they are put out there in the world by those who will be practicing in this area, particularly the municipalities. So the first change is on page two on line one, the notwithstanding clause that starts subsection B now reads notwithstanding subdivisions 312A2D and C2 of this title. Uh, that is in place of the notwithstanding clause that just listed 1BSA 312 generally. Uh, that will direct the reader's attention to those two specific subdivisions that we are dealing with here um, so that there's no confusion around that. Okay. Anybody have any questions about that or concerns? Nope. All right, thanks. The next, next change is in subdivision three of that subsection B, it starts on line eight of page two. Uh, you added the terms publicly accessible prior to designated electronic locations. So the subdivision now requires uh, that an affected public body, if they determine it's necessary, uh, that they post any meeting nota, agenda or notice of a special meeting in two publicly accessible designated electronic locations in lieu of the two designated public places within the municipality. That was based on the list serve discussion that you all had yesterday. Any questions about that one or comments? Nope. Okay. Moving on to subsection C, and these are some of the more substantive changes uh, based on yesterday's discussion. In subdivision C1, you added the requirement that the affected public body use technology that permits the attendance and participation of the public through electronic or other means. Okay. Further Any on, and if you're looking at draft 2.2, this is highlighted. And this was the uh, result of the discussion you asked for between uh, the press, VLCT, and myself. Subdivision C3 now reads that the affected public body shall post information that enables the public to directly access and participate in meetings electronically and shall include this information in the published agenda for each meeting. So any questions or comments on those two changes? No. Mike? I'm just wondering if, again, when it just says the information is published on the agenda, that towns can read that to mean call the town office, you know, which is what the problem is now, rather than saying, adding the word shall include this information and then add the words, including access codes in the published agenda for each meeting. I, because as I, of now, they claim that they do have that information on there that you've got to call and get pre-approval to be in a public meeting. 
I think line 19 says, enables the public to directly access and participate. Plus, may I say, Madam Chair, that, you know, 15 years from now or whenever, you know, whenever there, it, who knows what, what that information will be in, as a technology and electronic systems evolve. So I think that you have directly said the public has to be able to directly access the meeting and participate in it through the information on the agenda. Yes, I think that that, that word directly access answers yeah, that. I agree. I mean, eventually, we're just going to have electrodes implanted in our brains. We're not going to have to do any of this stuff. We're just going to show up right. and play things. It's just all going to happen without exactly. us even caring to do anything about it. Exactly. You'll just think it. It's like but, the wigs. You just wiggle your nose and you'll participate. <laughs> Matter of fact, that way. you've already been wired, Senator Polina. I don't know if they informed you. <laughs> yeah. They don't necessarily, well, under these, we should pass all this. They have to tell us when we're wired. That's the thing. <laughs> I don't think they have to. Brian? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, to Mike's point, I wonder if Gwen would um, just comment on whether she feels a municipality could read that in any other way than to provide the information that would allow the public to uh, get into the room. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Gwyn Zakov, VLCT. Um, it says, I mean, I, I think my interpretation is how the rest of the committee is interpreting it. So that would be our advice, but to catch every single individual's interpretation of it, you know, we can only capture so much in our advice for municipal boards that contact us directly. There's others that contact the Secretary of State's office. Obviously we don't have school boards as members that are talking to the school board association. So they might be getting different advice, but um, you know, to us, if it, if it reads uh, publicly accessible where they have to be able to get direct access, um, that even narrows the scope down more than the previous language, which didn't have that level of specificity. And I think, you know, when you have too much detail, if this is gonna be, you know, triggered for, you know, six months down the line or two years down the line or four years down the line um, to add things like passwords or access codes or anything like that. We don't know what mm -hmm. this will look like. So it's, you don't want to make it so narrow that it's, it, then, then you're all actually preventing, you know, other versions of access, right? So um, I think in and of itself, the fact that the legislature would want to change the language from what it was or what it is currently is indicating that the legislature, the legislative intent then becomes, we are recognizing that we want the public to access it in this direct way and there's no you know, room, wiggle room for interpretation there. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so is everybody okay with that? Yep. Okay, Tucker? You are the muted. final change here. Sorry, I did not realize I was muted. I enjoyed being muted during the discussion of the uh, implantation of nodes. Um, <laughs> so the the last change was that you removed the subsection that allowed, in the event of a staffing shortage, for the uh, ten calendar day extension. Um, that is gone from this version. And that is the summary of changes that you made within this section. So it just, the minutes are, it just reverts back to the underlying law, which says five days. Which says five days, yes. Okay. Uh, Madam Allison? Chair. Allison? I know, I know I was wildly outvoted on this, but the, we are talking, I mean, the only reason I would put one more plug in for the 10 days or longer than five days is we are talking about an emergency, an all hazards emergency. And you know, what happens if that emergency means you have no electro you have no electricity? So, you know, yes, people could whip out the minutes, but they can't get them anywhere necessarily in, in a I just I think we have the law to go back to the five days uh, as an underlying law, but what we're addressing here is emergency measures. And it just strikes me that in an emergency, you may want a few more days than the five days. I just, I was thinking about it in the shower this morning. And I thought, really? I mean, we're talking about this. This is 
very specific for something that isn't normal, where we may not have all the things we need. Which may be even more to the point about why it needs to be done um, at, yes. um, available quickly because you are ha you're having to act quickly. And so decisions um, are being made. And if, they're, if nobody knows about those decisions for 10 days, that that could be problematic too. And I think that if you had no electricity, yeah, then you wouldn't have an active website and you would just post it at the town hall. I mean, right, right. So, no, no, I hear you. I just was. Yeah. Thank you. We're trying to think around the corners and yes. And it does, is everybody OK with taking that out and reverting back to the five days other than Allison? Brian? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, they, they're all fine with it, I'm sure. And is Chris with us? Oh, there oh. he is. You aren't on my screen. OK, there you are. Well, I can't do anything about your screen there. I know. OK. Are you OK with that? Me? Yeah, I had a thumb. I did a thumbs up. Sorry. OK, sorry about that. And Gwen and Mike and Don, Ross. And who else is here? Lisa. Oh, Lisa is with us. Good. So we're okay with that. Brian, Brian has his hand up. Yeah. There's something about my screen. Okay, Brian. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Madam Chair. So <laughs> I'm just wondering, since we are in essence deleting something that people are already kind of familiar with now, would the league send out anything letting people know that it has gone back to five days or, or is that necessary? And in other words, are people going to realize that it's not 10 the next time it happens? Oh, good point. Um, the, uh, once the legislature passes this, or once it goes into effect, and once there is a, an effective date that's put into the bill, um, you know, hopefully would have, you know, some heads up to to give us uh, some time to give our members some forewarning. But we have, um, because the Open Meeting Law and Public Records Act, things are prob probably the most requested um, information tidbit that comes from our members. Um, it's usually um, something we would do an all email blast to all of our members and not just like select boards and managers, but to like, you know, zoning boards and, and whatnot. Um, so we will update our COVID-19 um, FAQs for the open meeting law uh, stuff. So it, it, there might be some, you know, the, the effective date, right, there might be some confusion because whenever laws change, it's people get used to one way and then it takes a little while for people to get on on the same page. Um, so there might be a bit of a lag time, but um, uh, having a little bit of, of, of lag time to um, get uh, uh, legislative bodies aware of what's going on is helpful. But, um, you know, we'll do our part, at least letting our members know. I can't speak to any other municipal <laughs> um, or public bodies that are not municipalities that are, you know, cities and towns and villages, though. So, uh, but also, Brian, this effective passage is January 21. So um, uh, it, it, it may take us through all the emergency of this year. I mean, it may take us through all the executive orders and the declared emergency, current, yeah. uh, current declared emergency. So it may just naturally, I mean, because our current law is in place until January of 21. Yeah, so, I just, some people would probably, some people, in the event that there's a, there's a subsequent declaration, they may just assume that it, all those, yeah, I remember all those new laws when we did it before, they must be the same ones. That's all. Yeah. Oh, Tucker. I am glad that there is a more astute mind than mine here to back me up. But uh, I think that Act 92, because it is more specific and specifically calls out the COVID-19 outbreak it has an expression of legislative intent that states very clearly at the beginning that during the continued spread of COVID-19, that during the state's response in the state of emergency specific to that outbreak, 
the temporary open meeting law provisions that you put out there should be in place to ensure public access to meetings while protecting the health and safety of the public, that the current provisions allowing for the 10 business days would continue as a more specific authority that you have granted, and that in the case of a future state of emergency that would trigger the provisions you're working on now, the general work that you are putting into statute here would then be triggered for future events, but it wouldn't necessarily supersede the very specific work you did in response to COVID. So, uh, you know, the 10 day allowance will continue through the current state of emergency. When it ends, it's over. And then the general laws become available to public bodies moving forward. Okay, I appreciate the answer. Thank you. Okay. All right. So are we okay with open meeting issues? Yep. Um, Brian? Yes. Yes, yes. Mike, Ross, Lisa? I don't hear anything. Yes, sorry. Okay. I was Sorry. muted there. Sorry. It's yes. very difficult to mute you, Mike. <laughs> I'm glad we've found a way. But others have tried. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Lisa? Yes, I'm good with it. Okay, thanks. Thank you and Ross? You yes, got it. yes. Okay, great. Thank you for your Thank work. You, Tucker. Appreciate it. Thank you, Tucker. That was <laughs> Thank great. Thank you very much. We okay. thread that needle. Good work. Now we can <laughs> sew. S E W or S O W? Um, uh, well, we want to move. It, it will sow different types of seeds, and yes, we're sewing it up both. <laughs> can we move on to the municipal quasi judicial proceedings? Section two. Yeah. Uh, yes, Madam Chair. The only update that I have for you in this section is that uh, the more astute mind than mine discovered that there were some capitalized board references within this section when they were supposed to not be capitalized. So there are some technical corrections throughout uh, both to existing statute and to some of the language that you've seen before to make sure that we are consistently lower casing our boards throughout 32 VSA section 4404. Otherwise, okay. I have no updates in a section for you. Good, Good job. Okay. Yeah. Who caught that? I'll give you a wild guess. <laughs> B-A-W or Nadine, one of them. <laughs> um, does anybody have any, we're all okay with that section? Yeah. This is when we need a uh, legislative trivial pursuit, you know, for one sometime. <laughs> Which is it, board capital B or little b? <laughs> and why? <coughs> okay, can we move on to section four, I think? Section three? Wait a minute, section three. Section three is the... Uh, next level of those BCA mm -hmm. grand list appeals, those deal with the hearing officers. It's the same language, uh, not requiring an inspection during the state of emergency added to the statutes dealing with uh, hearing officer appeals. Um, and there were no changes from the last time that you saw this language. Okay, any issues with that? Okay. All right. So now, section four. Which is the water disconnect? Yeah. So there is one update here that I will bring to your attention in the draft that you saw yesterday in subdivision A2 which is on page eight, line one of this draft. Uh, this subdivision accidentally stated that uh, the all hazard does not require the municipality 
to disconnect services. Um, and that was too specific because this section deals with multiple entities that provide the services. So we changed municipality to the water or sewer service provider to make sure that it covered municipalities, the private uh, permitted entities and the PUC regulated entities as well. Thank you, thank you for that because I was wondering about inter um, the non-transient, non-public, sorry, private, privately owned, public non-transient water supply systems, etc. So there's a few odd systems to take care and, of. Thank you. And, and of course, Woodstock has one of those, and I should have caught that. So, uh, but it. It, um, I'm just curious, it is regulated, the, the private systems are still regulated by the PUC. I, I thought some were regulated by ANR. Some oh. are permitted through uh, the Title 10 ANR process. They're called out um, as well in subsection A. Good. Um, something to note related to this, but not necessarily within the purview of the work that you're doing, when you first started discussing this section, you discussed the um, arrearages payments that came out of the CRF funds to some of these utility providers. And it was brought to my attention uh, yesterday that those arrearages payments are actually only available to one type of entity, or at least the individual who emailed me said that it was only available to one type of entity. And that would be the PUC regulated entities. I don't know if there was some confusion around that, but ultimately it didn't impact the work that you did because the provision that you put in here requires uh, the rate payer to uh, make right any amounts due after the end of the moratorium. Gwen, are you okay with this? Um, yeah, the same question had come up um, from our towns about <clears throat> uh, whether there could be interest and fees and um, uh, collected and how long it was. But I think it's, I think it's covered in this in this wording here. Um, so I don't I don't think we have any issues right now. No. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. Um, municipal deadlines. Section five. I have no updates for you in section five. <clears throat> okay. Anybody have any issues or concerns or questions about section five? Okay. How about section six, highway funds repeal? I think we were okay with that yesterday. Anybody change their mind? I just have one question, and I just want to be 100% sure. Um, this is a permanent change, right? This is... No. A permanent, no. Oh, it is a permanent... Oh, it is. It's repealing. It. Okay, yes, that's it okay. I just wanted to make sure I, I got it correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, because it's repealing that section. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So... Good work, Tucker. Thank you. So do we want to move on to uh, local elections? Hello. Hi, Betsy For the record, Betsy Ann Rask, Legislative Council. Uh, no changes to the local elections provisions. This section seven allows a, a legislative body to move the time and date of an upcoming annual or special meeting during a state of emergency, if the legislative body determines that the circumstances of that emergency may harm the public, and they'd have to schedule a new meeting as soon as practicable and warn it accordingly. And I did hear, <coughs> excuse me, from Senator Baruth about these sections as they related to school boards, because they had gotten a, um, they had a draft of a bill or they had a bill from the House Education Committee that also um, addressed this in some way, but they thought ours was more um, accurate and detailed. And so they're going to take the section that section out of the education bill and um, 
they approved this. Good. But Betsy section... Ann knows how to do elections. <laughs> That section seven was about moving the time. Wait, wait, wait. I think Mike had a question. Oh, sorry. Did you have a question, Mike? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, just, just to be clear, we we had a situation uh, in Grand Isle. So it says that must uh, when it's postponed, and then it must be whatever duly warned or whatever it says. Does that mean that? It needs another 30 to 40 days and go through that whole process of that I time thought, frame. So they, they can't just postpone it like 10 days or something like that. They've got to go through the whole public notice, posting in three spots, taking 30 to 40 days or whatever. That's how I would read that. I don't know if VLCT has any. That's how I was yes. reading it, but I was just wondering if. if because I think some South Burlington has a charter that allows them to come back quicker or something like that. But other okay. towns, I think, had to wait on revote of a school budget or something. Yeah. When? Okay. Just. Would this not withstand charter, more specific charters, or not? Uh, I, I would think not. I guess it would depend on the language of the charter, but if the charter addresses uh, a way to move the time and date of a meeting, then that I would read that charter provision as controls the special law. Okay. 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 We're fine with the language as is. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Australian Bell? What's that? Oh, no, just go. Okay. go Section eight is about the ability of the legislative body to apply the Australian ballot system to an upcoming annual or special meeting um, during a state of emergency. Um, and it has to be uh, for an upcoming meeting that um, they could do this not less than 60 days in advance of that meeting to move to Australian ballot, which uh, should give them enough time to uh, prepare as necessary, the Australian ballot itself and um, get the questions on it, on the ballot. And that language in sub B um, says that uh, a legislative body that does so is not subject to the statutory deadlines or provisions um, related in a, a school district articles of agreement related to the meeting that conflict with the need to apply Australian ballot to the meeting to the extent necessary to enable the municipality to apply Australian ballot to that meeting. It seems it still seems to me that that's more of uh, just in case language, belts and suspenders. It would seem that the 60 days is enough time to give them to meet all the current law deadlines. Um, but as I understand, I got feedback from the Secretary of State's office. They seem fine with this language as is. So that that B might just be in there as just in case there are any other deadlines that might get in the way of moving to Australian ballot. Anybody have any questions or concerns about this section? No. Oh, okay. So then the bill moves into professional regulation. And I've just been discussing this with Jen Carby, who handles uh, Board of Medical Practice issues, as well as the executive director of the Board of Medical Practice and director of OPR. And there, after discussing with them just further, there were a few tweaks to this, uh, the, these sections, a couple of them. Um, three of them are in the nature of a technical correction, and then the Board of Medical Practice actually requested that one of the sections be struck. But there was no change in this first one, Section 9, which provides that during a state of emergency, the director of OPR can extend up to 90 days at a time the expiration dates of OPR licenses and waive any fees that would have applied if the circumstances of the state of emergency create a barrier to obtaining renewal. And to confirm the prior draft contains similar language for uh, licenses under the Office of Governor, but that is out of the bill. It's not in the bill. 
Okay. As far as the three uh, technical corrections, I just noticed that, actually, I think it was Jen that noticed, um, in regard to these out-of-state healthcare professionals, this is first the bill starts with OPR statutes because those are in Title III, and then it moves on to Board of Medical Practice statutes. Um, but this section and um, another section referred to, um, in one place, one of these sections referred to uh, the regulatory jurisdiction of OPR, and you can see that language on page 12 line 16, and then the next section, it referred to both, quote, the phrase regulatory and disciplinary jurisdiction of OPR. Well, disciplinary authority is part of regulatory authority. So just to make it both consistent, both OPR and Board of Medical Practice agreed, it should just be regulatory jurisdiction because disciplinary is included within regulatory jurisdiction. So that was a technical correction that we caught. Um, in the, and so just to remind, um, this section 10, and you'll see it again for Board of Medical Practice, but this section 10 is for OPR, and it provides that during a state of emergency, in consultation with the Commissioner of Health, the Director of OPR can authorize a healthcare professional who practices in one of OPR's profession and who holds a valid license of practice in another U.S. jurisdiction to be deemed to be licensed uh, to practice here for a patient located in Vermont using either telehealth or as part of a facility. Um, so long as the healthcare professional is in good standing in that other US state, not subject to any professional disciplinary proceedings there and is not barred from practicing here in Vermont uh, for reasons of fraud or abuse, patient care or patient safety. Um, and then someone who is deemed under this section uh, to provide healthcare services has to submit to OPR their contact information and where they're going to be practicing to provide pay, uh, healthcare services to uh, Vermonters. And the uh, person who does that, the professional who um, is providing those healthcare services is deemed to consent to the regulatory jurisdiction of OPR and this authority remains in effect until the state of emergency is terminated. Um, and so long as they remain in good license and good standing. So that provision was one of those in Act 91. Okay, any questions or concerns about that section? Okay, seeing none. All right. On page 13 in section 11, we're still in OPR. You can tell by the three VSA uh, start that title three is where OPR's main provisions are codified. This is about inactive healthcare professionals coming back to practice in a healthcare field. Um, if you recall, one of the um, requests from one of your prior drafts was to not use retired, instead use inactive. And so that change was already made in one of the mo your most recent drafts you reviewed. What this is doing is saying, again, during a state of emergency in consultation with the Commissioner of Health, that the Director of OPR can authorize a former healthcare professional who practiced in one of OPR's healthcare professions and who left active practice um, between three, not more than three years earlier with their license in good standing. They can provide healthcare services to a patient located in Vermont using telehealth or as uh, part of staff after they submit their contact information, including where they'll be practicing to OPR. Uh, the returning healthcare professional uh, would be authorized to provide those healthcare services for not more than 30 days pending their application for a temporary license or until the director of OPR determines whether to issue a temporary license, whichever comes first. And then finally in sub C, uh, the director can issue temporary licenses to these uh, returning healthcare professionals at no charge and can impose limits on their scope of practice as the director deems appropriate. And anybody who does this at the top of page 14 um, is subject to the regulatory jurisdiction of the office. This is another place where there was, aside from that regulatory jurisdiction phrase, 
we just noticed that this uh, section used in one line a temporary license and in another line it used emergency license. We're talking about the same thing. So they agreed to just use the term temporary license. So that was the change there. Okay. Technical correction. Okay, great. Anybody with questions, concerns, comments on this section? No. No, no. And again, that was another Act 91 provision. And if, is Lisa still with? No. I don't see her here anymore. Because I can't. Okay, never mind. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. No problem. I'm on page 14 in section 12. There was no change to this um, section after we reviewed it again. Um, but the big picture, what's going on here, again, taken from Act 91, this is emergency authority for the director of OPR to act on behalf of OPR boards. So the language is during a state of emer emergency, if the director finds that a board attached to OPR cannot reasonably, safely, and expeditiously convene a quorum to transact business. And if it's authorized by the Secretary of State, this is one of the places where Secretary of State's office, uh, they, they suggested there'd be that hook there, that the Secretary of State authorizes this, the director can exercise the full powers and authorities of the OPR board, including disciplinary authority, so that they can keep, keep going um, in case it's not safe for one of their boards to meet. Um, as a reminder, OPR regulates about 50 professions, and I think 18 of them still have boards. Uh, signature of the director has the same force and effect as a voted act of the board. And if the director takes such an action, uh, it has to be published conspicuously on the website of the board on whose behalf the director took action. So Any no change in there from prior drafts. Oh, sorry, Madam Chair. No, that's okay. Any questions, concerns, comments on this section? No. Okay. All right. So I think this is the final OPR provision in section 13. This is the ability of the director in a state of emergency to issue emergency regulatory orders, again, taken from Act 91. So it has to be during a declared state of emergency. The director may issue such orders governing regulated professional activities and practices as may be necessary to protect the public. And if the director finds that a professional act by a person licensed or supposed to be licensed by OPR is exploitative, deceptive, or detrimental to the public, or some combo of those, the director can issue cease and desist orders. Um, and then if there is such a cease and desist orders and the office makes reasonable efforts to publicize it or serve the order on affected persons, it's binding on all persons licensed or required to be licensed by OPR and a violation of the order can subject the person to professional discipline. It could render um, the need for an injunction by the superior court and uh, deemed a violation of unauthorized practice. And no change there. Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Can you just uh, give us an example of what might be considered a, um, an, a, a professional practice act or that is deemed um, exploitative or yeah. deceptive, like selling masks or uh, what? Uh, well, I, I thought it was neat when uh, this question came up for the director before, and she said that the OPR had used this authority during mm -hmm. COVID via Act 91, and it was for MMA fighting, I believe that she said. Oh, yeah. That couldn't be, there couldn't be, um, you know, people had to maintain social distancing, but here was a group of people apparently uh, engaging in MMA fighting, boxing, and MMA fighting is a regulated profession under OPR, and so there they use that authority to okay. uh, require that to stop. Okay, thank you. Which was a neat one. Um, I don't know, maybe we can, I can reach out to her and to see if there were other ones she can give an example for you on, if that would be helpful. I, I mean, I think that's okay. Okay. Thank you. So I'll note here D that- Does any, oh, oh go sorry, ahead. go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead, Betsy. Well, I was gonna move on, sorry, Madam Chair. Does anybody have any, any other questions or concerns or comments on this section? 
No, Madam Chair, and thank you for asking that question because I had the same question. What could somebody possibly do? But I do remember her mentioning the, because yeah. uh, it was in Rutland, uh, <laughs> the MMA. Uh, fun. Also, I could think it would apply, you know, when uh, salons closed down, you know, if a cosmetologist went back and was opening up her, his shop, um, that could be a, uh, another way that uh, or another reason to use this authority a cease and desist um, because okay. yeah um so i'll note here that we jen raised a good question because um for board of medical practice the prior draft referred to uh opr's 3 vsa 127 for unauthorized practice for the same statute the same language that would have applied to the board of medical practice and that, that that wouldn't work because board of medical practice doesn't use OPR's 3 VSA 127 for unauthorized practice and so we started to discuss um, what might be a, a proper substitute and on further reflection the executive director of the board of medical practice has requested that this same section not be included in the Board of Medical Practice section. Um, I, as I understood it, the Board of Medical Practice doesn't you ha ordinarily have cease and desist authority. And it appeared from what I gathered that um, they would already be able to address this in other ways. So as I understood it, the overall perception of the board at this time was it wasn't, it's not necessary to include it in this bill draft. Um, so that was the one substantive request from the Board of Medical Practice would be to remove that section. And so I did that for this draft since, um, as I understood it, the executive director advised it, it probably not, they didn't want to pursue it at this time. So that was okay. the one substantive change for the Board of Medical Practice. Any questions or concerns or comments on, on this section? No. Thank you. Thank you. So then in section 14, you're gonna to start to see a repeat um, of these same provisions, but for the Board of Medical Practice, you can tell we're talking about the Board of Medical Practice in section 14, because it starts out with 26 VSA. Um, that's title 26 is where the Board of Medical Practices statutes are um, versus OPRs <laughs> being in title three of the Vermont statutes annotated. And it goes a little bit out of order. That's the third technical correction um, because the Board of Medical Practice has different subchapters, um, and one of them is about the board specifically, and then a following subchapter is about licenses. And after reviewing some of these provisions, it appeared that this first one in section 14 about the executive director being able to act on behalf of the Board of Medical Practice in states of emergency, it really should go into the board subchapter. And so that's why the order is not identical uh, between OPR and Board of Medical Practice. Because I think this um, same provision for OPR was just in a different place, but that's the reason why I just moved it up from a different, um, it was further on in the bill, but just moved it up to this section 1378 because it fits within the board subchapter. But it's the same language we already reviewed for uh, OPR, which is that during a state of emergency, if the executive director finds the board of medical practice cannot safely meet, um, and if the commissioner of health authorizes it, executive director can exercise the full powers of the board of medical practice, including disciplinary authority. Anything that the executive director signs is the same force and effect as if the board of medical practice did it. And there has to be a record of those actions that are posted conspicuously on the board's website. And I would, I will give a prize to any committee member who actually saw that, that it was in a different order and questioned <laughs> about why it was in a different order. Did anybody pick that up? If you did, you get a prize. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Betsy Ann. I guess we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I just wanted to point it out there. That's okay. why it changed a little bit, but without any change to substance. Um, so section 15, 
Now skipping ahead to 26 VA say 1405, because now we're in the licensing subchapter. Um, this is the same thing about out-of-state health care workers mm -hmm. being able to come back and practice in Vermont during a state of emergency um, and when authorized by the Commissioner of Health. The executive director of the Board of Medical Practice can authorize a healthcare professional who practices one of the board's professions and holds a valid license in some other U.S. jurisdiction to be deemed licensed here in Vermont to provide healthcare services to a patient in Vermont using telehealth or as part of staff provided same qualifications. They're licensed um, in that other U.S. jurisdiction, not subject to any professional disciplinary proceedings anywhere in the U.S. and um, not affirmatively affirmatively barred to practice here in Vermont for reasons of fraud or abuse, patient care or public safety. Um, a person who is deemed to be authorized has to submit their contact info, including where they're practicing to the board and uh, they consent to the jurisdiction, the regulatory jurisdiction of the board. There's that technical correction, regulatory jurisdiction and this authority remains in effect until the state of emergency is terminated and so long as the professional remains licensed in good standing. Any questions, concerns, comments on that section? No. Okay, All thank right. you. We are on section 16 now, and this is about those inactive healthcare professionals coming back to practice. Um, it's very similar to what we already reviewed. For the OPR, this is for the Board of Medical Practice saying during a declared state of emergency, when authorized by the Commissioner of Health, the Executive Director of the Board of Medical Practice can authorize a former healthcare professional who practiced one of the board's professions and left active practice not more than three years ago with their Vermont license in good standing to provide healthcare services to a patient located in Vermont, either by telehealth or as part of a at staff as a facility after they submit their contact info, including where they'll be practicing to the board. Um, they can do so without a license for not more than 30 days pending their application for a temporary license or until the executive director determines whether to issue a temporary license, whichever is first. And the executive director can issue these temporary license to these returning healthcare professionals at no charge and impose limits on their scope of practice. And they're subject to the regulatory jurisdiction of the board. So there's those two other technical corrections using the phrase regulatory jurisdiction and then consistently calling it a temporary license um, because it in two places, it called it temporary license in one, emergency license in the other. Okay. Anybody questions with that? No. Okay, thank you. Okay, on to sheriffs. Yeah, so just a reminder that Board of Medical Practice about uh, the emergency regulatory authority of the executive director was moved out, no longer right. in here. So we get to the sheriffs and this is the authority based on Act 100 for a sheriff to be able to use county reserve funds when approved by the assistant judges. Uh, this was the same thing that you put in your Act 100, now just here for a future state of emergency. So it's saying during a state of emergency that affects a county in order to support the emergency needs of that county sheriff due to the emergency, the county's operation reserve funds and capital reserve funds that are described elsewhere in law may be allowed to be used for the emergency needs of the sheriff subject to the approval of the assistant judges. There's that same definition of emergency needs that was taken from Act 100. It's the needs to respond to the emergency and it includes hiring deputies, dispatchers, and other personnel and purchasing equipment and supplies. And this emergency funding from the reserve funds is in addition to the minor uh, support of the sheriff's department um, that's set forth elsewhere in law. His big picture right now, uh, sheriffs are not allowed by statutory law to access these reserve funds and motor um, contract work aside from the sheriff's own statutory salary. 
it goes on like Act 100 did to say that if a sheriff receives those county reserve funds for emergency needs, the sheriff is required to apply to any applicable resources for emergency leave. Whoops. Sorry, I got the notice my internet was unstable. Um, they have to apply to applicable resources for emergency relief like FEMA that are known to the sheriff for any allowable reimbursement. And then within 30 days of any getting, getting any of that reimbursement, the sheriff has to provide those funds to the county in order to reimburse the county. But a sheriff's only responsible for reimbursing the county in an amount equal to what they got through those uh, other resources like FEMA. And there is a sunset, the authority for the sheriff to obtain funding for emergency needs under sub A sunsets two weeks after the day the governor terminates the state of emergency, which is also what was in Act 100. Any questions, concerns about that? I think we heard from both the sheriffs and the side judges that they were okay with this language. Seems like I remember that. Yep, no, uh, no problem. Okay. All right, the last one's the effective date section. So this bill overall would take effect on January 1 of next year except that uh, repeal of the use of the town highway funds would take effect on July 1 of next year. And that is because of, remind us why that does, won't take effect until July. I think there was a reason. A, a Tucker question. I'm not exactly sure why there needs to it, be that future effective date. I, I do remember the cotton. Yes, Tucker, would you like to remind us? Sure. The, uh, the repeal is set for the start of the next fiscal year for most okay. of the municipalities so that the prohibition on commingling of funds will be lifted at the same time as the towns are heading into the new, next budget cycle. Um, that way, this will pass and they'll have some advance notice that as of July 1st, you know, the requirement for the separate town highway fund is going away and they can start sharing if need be. Sounds good to me. Anybody else have any questions or concerns or thoughts about that one? Here, I see Karen and Gwen are both with us. No? Yeah, they might still, They. I knew that they had to participate in the emergency management call. Oh, I see maybe Karen's coming back. Yeah, but I um, I haven't actually seen the, I haven't been looking at the right draft, <laughs> sorry. Well, the, I think the main question is, uh, um, right now the effective date of um, mixing the highway fund, town highway funds yeah. takes effect on July 1st of 2021. Yes, we that we think that's fine. Okay. All right, committee, where are we? We're good. Do you have anything to say? I think we're no. in a good place. Yeah. I think oh, we've learned I think we've learned lessons. <laughs> And I have my, I, I want you to see your clerk is prepared. She has a vote sheet. <laughs> now, did we, do All right. about, did we do anything about electronic vote sheets? No, I still have to mail these to Gail. <laughs> you know what I saw another kitty do? Just snap a photo of it with your phone and you could just send it. You could just email it. I could, but I want to keep the post office in business. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Speaking of um, mailing, um, did you all get your ballots today for the judicial retention? No. Yes. yes. Not yet because I haven't gotten my mail yet. Oh. It will be downstairs when I get back down. Wow, I'm impressed. Did you? Are you still running, chairing those elections, uh, chair? <laughs> no, I have chosen not to do this one. I love doing it, but. Um, because it would, it requires going to Montpelier and it doesn't oh. make any sense for me to drive to Montpelier just to do that. And Becca will be in Montpelier anyway for a separate um, meeting. So well, it makes sense to have her do it. 
Anthony. We could volunteer Anthony. He lives so close. Well, I think they need two senators and they were trying to uh, ask senators who were, um, let me think how to put this, uh, not in a vulnerable population, meaning us old folks. Um, and uh, so Becca will do the tell the chief teller, I think, because she'll be there anyway for a meeting. Great. And I don't, I don't know who he asked for the second one. It might have been Anthony or might have been Andy. I, I, I don't know. Not that I know of. Okay. Well, are are we ready for <laughs> are we ready for a motion? Are we ready? We to yeah, we but, don't have a bill number, but um, I would I would move that we uh, uh, that we approve draft two point two of lessons learned. Second. <laughs> would anybody like to um, make a final comment or anything on this? Anybody out there? I would just say thank you for taking this up again. Well, we had to earn our keep. Likewise, we, were here we appreciate it. What? Sorry, Mike. <laughs> no, likewise, thank you for your work on this. I know it's a pain. and you got a lot on your plate and uh, always appreciate your work. So thank you, all of you. Thank you. And we appreciate the input from everybody. Yeah, well, and I think it's good. I think this bill is just the foundation upon which more will be attached. Uh, so we're, we'll have this is this is round one of lessons learned, and I think we'll see several other iterations of it. <coughs> okay. Do you want to? Um... Absolutely. So the motion is to approve draft two point two of our SGO's lessons learned bill. And are we ready for vote? Okay, mm -hmm. Senator Bray. <laughs> Apparently we're not. <laughs> Senator Bray, are you- Senator Bray. Uh, uh, are he we keeps calling trying to do his um, space I will come bar. Back. I will come back to Senator Bray. Senator okay. Clark, where, you know, she's hard to find too. Yes. <laughs> Senator Collimore. Yes. Senator Polina. Yes. Senator White. Yes. Senator Bray. Oh, yes. <laughs> unanimous vote. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Betsy and Tucker. Yes. Amen. Thank yeah. you. It was great work. Thank you. Um, yeah. Great work at the very beginning when we were doing the ones that ended up being acts that led into this. And then great work putting it together for us in this so, form. How many acts fed into this? Act 91. Act, 100. Act 100, 91, 100. And what else, Betsy or Tucker? 92. Yeah, oh. Act 91 was the first COVID act and that's where the professional regulation stuff came from. Act 92 was your GovOps first uh, emergency bill and that had the election stuff and Tucker most of Tucker's got a variety of bills in here actually act 106 wow There's so we're up to four acts fed this bill so that's so good it's it's like not having to duplicate our work in the future it's like we've done this work this is a great this is great Carpe diem, seize the moment. We're putting in, in this is great. Okay. Well, and I, I am I am happy to report it unless somebody wants to. I think you should report it, Madam Chair, because it's your baby. So Betsy and, and Tucker, if you have any notes that um, I mean I think I'm pretty clear, but so don't don't spend a lot of time coming doing a lot of detailed notes, but if you have helpful hints, that would be great. Thank you. And, and a summary of the bill would be useful for us, those of us who are writing about it. So, okay, committee, 
Yay. <laughs> Good work. So um, the one other thing that we had on the agenda for today was S220. If, if we know where that is and what has happened to it, Betsy, and do you know? Yeah, so it's just waiting house action. It got voted out of House Give Ups and House Ways and Means and House Approps. But today the house is first doing the budget. Um, and oh, well, that'll take a while. Yeah, they just uh, they just uh, started, I believe, at two o'clock. And so I think it was tentative as to whether the house would take up S220 today. Um, I think, well, as I understand it, they're going to do a caucus of the whole just to do an overview and then they would go to floor, but I just don't know if it's going to be today or tomorrow. I think they're being flexible with their schedule. So aside from any surprise um, house amendments or anything, were, were there any major changes other than the ones that you gave us before? Nope. All, all the changes right now are what is, thank you to Gail for posting this. It's on, uh, posted on your webpage, mm -hmm. uh, the HGO amendment. And so there yep. are just the eight instances of amendment that we already mm -hmm. reviewed. Mm -hmm. And what did Ways and Means do about the structure or the fee structure? Did they do anything? Nope. They, they just want more information about oh. the OPR's fee structure and how it works and, um, but they had no amendments to propose. Okay. Okay. Is that somebody that we should be paying attention to? Okay, I guess not. Anyway, so um, committee, I think what we have on Tuesday is the National Guard and a couple people have asked to testify. How are you? On that. So I'm a little confused. I just, we just need help for the Somebody's a little confused. <laughs> uh, it sounds like Brian, though. It sounds like a funny loop of our tape. No. Oh. <laughs> well, whatever it is, let's try to ignore it and see if we can <laughs> finish up today. And then on, I would also like us on Tuesday to, um, if we allowed an hour for the National Guard and that, topic is that enough do you think anthony probably probably okay yeah. and then i uh, would like to go through 124 with betsy to see where <clears throat> the house is on it and also have um commissioner Sherling come in and talk to us because as you know the governor put out an executive order and some of the things in the executive order sound like he just lifted them out of 124 so <clears throat> have um look at have Mike Sherling come in and talk to us about how how they work together and if there's any conflict or I, I don't think there is but just so that we understand what's um, the <coughs> the relationship there and then Wednesday um, uh, BGS purchasing to just to talk to them because we heard from uh, corrections that it took VGS so long to go through the purchasing procedure that they actually weren't able to get the PPEs that that they wanted. So, um, and then any charters, if, I mean, I think that next week we have to be a little bit flexible around charters and 124. The, those are the two things. Is sure. that where yep. we are? Yeah. Sounds so good. I don't think we need to meet tomorrow. Do you? Wow. Because they won't have passed 220. Right. And even if they do pass 220, um, well, maybe I should ask, are we okay with with the changes that they made? There was uh, a VCIC proposal. Betsy went through these before. They pushed the deadlines. They removed the section that says about removal of street clothing. And then they pushed back some other dates and they changed the effective date. So really the only two changes other than dates were the removal of clothing and the uh, VCIC proposal, which was, which came from VCIC. I'm fine with them. Anthony? 
As much as I can remember, yes. I remember we agreed okay. with them at the time we went through them. Allison? I'm with Anthony. I just, uh, I, I'm sort of booting up as I remember our conversation a, a couple days ago and looking at this. And yeah, Chris. It, it would be helpful when we do to have somebody from uh, SGO, uh, HGO come and just talk about what the reasoning was behind them. But other than that, I'm fine. Yeah, I don't care. I just don't want, I, um, we can, if they voted it out, even if they voted it out tomorrow, we wouldn't get it on Tuesday, right? On the floor. So oh. we would have Tuesday afternoon to just um, briefly look at that. Okay. Right. So I don't. I don't know about having somebody come in from the house. I mean, if they yeah. all they did was change effective dates, what, no. what difference does it yeah. make? Well, well change the removal of clothing that's the only could, could we just could maybe could we just ask betsy for um just to give us like yeah. give me like one sentence on each of those changes so i remember what they were yeah what okay. and what their thinking was why yes. i mean why did they change the clothing i think if we did that then we wouldn't have to meet tomorrow so yeah. right just be reminded yes all okay, right betsy Ann? sure do you have the uh, amendment in front of you yep it's right here on our website all right First instance of amendment is just changing the language about criminal background checks that OPR is allowed to conduct. Um, the bill has passed the Senate contained the FBI's requested language. And then this change reflects BCIC's just tweaks that they had. The uh, second and third instances of amendment are related to the deadlines in regard to clinical pharmacy prescribing. There were deadlines for the Commissioner of Health to adopt some of the uh, state protocols and the Board of Pharmacy to have rules to support clinical pharmacy prescribing um, by January. And so they extended those deadlines from January to July of next year. Just for more time, purpose of more time. Sure. The fourth and fifth instances of amendment are in regard to the massage body workers touch professionals regulation. And remember, it's a registration requirement. And one of the um, qualifiers to register was you only have to register if you're providing those services to clients in a manner in which they remove street clothing and have a reasonable expectation of privacy. The fourth and fifth instances of amendment would remove the street, street clothing qualifier. I think just, I, I can't speak to legislative intent, but the conversation was, how do you tell gym clothes, taking those off, you know, taking off a sweatshirt, you're in a gym. I just think part of it was, you know, what constitutes street clothes and, um, how are you really going to regulate, how are you going to regulate that? So they just took that all out. <clears throat> Our providing service is still a qualifier that you only register if you uh, assist a client in a manner in which they have a reasonable expectation of privacy. So that privacy <laughs> still isn't there. Great. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Sixth instance of amendment is also in that massage chapter, and I'd call this a technical clarification. So there's that section in there that says who's exempted from the registration requirement, and it lists all these professions that are already have to get licensed, and they might incorporate massage or body work into their normal um, scope of practice. And so one of the professions that was listed was nurses. And as I understand it, there was a request from some APRNs to specify that nurses includes APRNs. And so they just added including APRNs I'd, as a technical clarification. Fine with them. Yep. And then uh, seventh and eighth instance of amendment relate to the effective dates. So the uh, massage provisions in the bill as passed the Senate would have taken effect on November 1. And in the eighth instance of amendment that got moved out to April 1 to allow OPR more time to 
um, prepare for regulating these new professions. And so there was also that separate section that said three years out from the effective date, OPR needs to report back to the legislature on how things are going and whether there should be any amendments to this regulatory structure. And so since they moved out the overall effective date of massage to April 1, 2021, they then moved out in the seventh instance amendment that report back to be April 1, 2024 to allow the full three years. So, oh, sorry. so committee, I, I, unless there are any questions or concerns right now, I, I would um, say that we, when, whenever we, get, whenever it hits the floor of the Senate, that we would just concur with their, with their changes, unless somebody has a problem with that. I'm fine with that. That's fine. Allison? Yeah. And there's a grinning Chris Bray. Yes, I'm, I'm still grinning. <laughs> yes, yes. He's so grinning. I don't think- he, He's grinning because it's only 303. <laughs> I, so I think that <clears throat> we, there's no need for us to meet again about 220 and when, whenever it comes to the floor, we'll just concur. Okay? Sure. Yep. All right, so I don't think there's any need for us to meet tomorrow unless everybody just really, really wants to on Friday afternoon. It, it's, I'm all set. <laughs> it's not gonna be easy, but I think I can manage to stay away for an afternoon. Chris? Uh, well, it's been at least a year since we've had a Friday afternoon discussion of cannabis in Vermont. Mm -hmm. I thought maybe we could use the extra time to revisit that. Yes, how, how's your conference committee going? <laughs> Remember how you just said it was 302, Anthony? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's going. Jeanette, Jeanette, are you still meeting? Um, I, I don't know what's happening right now. You know, the house is in charge. We have given them a proposal and um, we're, we'll see what happens. Well, good luck. Yeah. So anyway, okay. So I don't think we need, there's any need for us to meet tomorrow afternoon. And so everybody well, can I, have a- I want to, I want to take us all and have a creamy. Oh, oh yes, it is creamy. Oh no, it's way past creamy time. That's May. It it's 80 degrees outside. Are you kidding? I know our creamy stand closed though already. They our, did? our creamy stand turned into a drive through creamy stand. You had to drive your car up to the window and make your order, drive your car up to the next window and pay, drive your car up to the next window and get to creamy. So wow. was, you really had to be careful because you're coming really close to the building at that point. Okay. <laughs> well, then, then they closed on they closed on Labor Day. So we're all done with creamies around here. So if, if anyone wants to come to Woodstock, we can have a homemade ice cream at the Woodstock Creamery. Thank you. I I think that I'll just go buy a pint of Ben and Jerry's instead of driving to Woodstock, but thank you. I would like to take a rain check. Okay, I am open to a rain check. Okay. And it's about to rain here, I think. So, Anybody? oh, it's been raining here matter. all afternoon, all day. So, Gail, are you set with um, Tuesday? Yeah, can you um, elaborate on the executive order that you'd like Michael Sher uh, Sherling to comment on? Oh, I have no idea what the number of it is, but he knows because he was in uh, judiciary this morning and I told him we were going to have him come and talk to us about the executive order. Yeah, okay. one that's, he understands that's great. Yeah, he the does. One that, the one that's based on our bill. Just mm -hmm. right. I'll send it to you, Gail. Oh, oh, you okay? Yeah, I printed it out, but I don't have it here with what, me now. So, what day did it come out? It came out Tuesday. No. I think it was last week. Oh, was it? Oh, I thought it was, okay. Do you have it, Betsy? And for BGS, would you like just Deb Daymore or do we need anybody else to join us on Wednesday? I mean, she really is the purchasing person. And I don't know if they even have a, a commissioner now, do they? They have an acting commissioner. Jennifer? Did Chris Cole resign? 
he retired. Oh, I missed that altogether. He did. He retired. What? When does he that happen? Use, use his skills someplace else. But when did that happen? I think a month um, ago. July, I think. Oh. Huh. So um, we, we, we should invite the acting commissioner okay. yeah. and then leave it up to them whether they, and, and we can tell them that it's just in, in response to the uh, concerns that were raised by the Department of Corrections about the length of time that it took to get a, per, to get a purchase order in order for them to be able to, to actually order their PPEs. And by the time they got the purchase order, the PPEs were gone. And if, if you want to, we can um, notify Commissioner Baker at DOC that we're going to just talk about this so that he knows. Okay. That'd be a good idea. Yeah. Anything else? Well, uh, let's see how creative we can be. No, we'll it's in. Huh? <laughs> At the end, have they taken up any charters yet? Oh, Tucker, Tucker, Tucker. No, they have not taken up any charters yet. And um, I, I know one of the charters you asked about was the Barry City Charter. And I can't remember if I mentioned it the last time you asked about that particular charter, but there was no uh, Barry City Charter Bill introduced this session. Um, well, it, so. it, that is, because what I, <clears throat> I got a note from them that said that there were two, two charters that they were consider that they were going to take up were both non-controversial. One was Barry City and one was Burlington. So maybe Barry it's just, Town doesn't have a charter, does it? Barry Town? Maybe it's Barry Town. Barry Town uh, also has both Barry Town and Barry City have charter amendments that were passed this spring. Neither of them were introduced this session as a bill. Oh, okay. Well, if they weren't in, we'll take them up when it, if, if the House takes them up, we'll we'll look at them. So the only one we're actively waiting for is the Burlington one. I'm wait, as soon as as soon as they take up any in their committee. Tucker, can you let us know? And then we'll look at them at the same time. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, committee, I think we're, unless right. you want to keep chatting. No, I think Mike, probably... Mike, has, Mike Donahue has an issue. Oh, I'm sorry, Mike. You're unmuted, but I can't hear you, Mike. Mike, we can't hear you. The press You're unmuted, fine. but no, we can't hear you. Try unmuting yourself again. Wonder if you turn down your volume on your laptop. No sound. <clears throat> this is the time for sign language. Send us an email, Mike. Or can you dance? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's your vol I think it's the volume on your computer. Yeah. Or just leave and come back. Then we'll and we'll be gone. <laughs> and we'll, be gone. <laughs> we'll we'll wait if you want to do that and come back. Okay. I'm going to end the live stream, senators. Good idea. Okay.